almost there. And we're live. Awesome. Um, welcome to the third webinar of our webinar series. Uh, my name is Steph Rovetti. I'm, I'm one of the players on the Sevens team. And um, today we have my fellow teammate, Chris Thomas, um, and again, our head coach, Coach Brown. Um, today we're going to um, talk about challenges that um, come with working in a team. So uh, Chris and I are going to kind of lead this one and talk about themes that we've come across and that we feel that happen when you work with a group of people. Um, so yep, Chris, over to you. Um, so during this presentation, we will reference a lot of our team values and what we basically stand for as a team. So this is our statement. This team will leave a legacy, ignite a love for rugby and the culture it represents, inspire our communities to be brave, unite the country, and we have this quote that we love, legacy is not leaving something for people, it's leaving something in people. So just keep that in mind as we go through this because we will refer back to the things that bond us as a team. Mm -hmm. And as Chris and I were kind of discussing what, 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 what we come across, it all kind of came back to um, our values and our, our, our things that we as a team value. So, um, all right, well, we'll just go ahead and hop into it. Um, first question is gonna be for Brownie. Um, we're gonna talk about what do you think makes a great team? What aspects do you believe create a great team? Well, firstly, can I just acknowledge, I mean, I love your container home. When did you, when did you actually move into a container home? Oh, <laughs> my outside <laughs> home gym. Well, yeah. well, it's brilliant, I'll tell you what, and that's commitment, you know? So, uh, hey, um, yeah, hey, g'day. Um, hopefully uh, there's a few of you jumping back on from the last couple of weeks and it's been a pretty good series so far. And uh, aspects of a great team. Um, look, I think first and foremost, uh, you need strong leadership. Uh, if you don't have strong leadership, then you've got no idea where you're going. Uh, and, and, and what I mean by that is that they need to provide uh, clear direction, an environment which promotes growth um, and development. So, uh, and, and, that, and that takes time and then there's different ways to achieve that. Uh, um, so yeah, in the environment side of things, uh, yeah. You're looking at the safety, you're looking at a love, a care, like almost like a, an acceptance, um, but also combined with a high level of execution. Um, I think then, then it comes down to the people that are involved, you know, you should, you, you've got the leadership or the direction, uh, but and then it's having the, the people that have the skill sets and the abilities to, to really take on um, or have the potential to take on the the tasks that it's, you know, and the things that are required for us to achieve our mission or our goal uh, are key. Um, and within that environment and with the people that you have, it's can you um, bring out the, the, the humility and the, 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 the qualities that ultimately put the, the, the group above the individual uh, and, uh, you know, that, that generally takes time. Um, but if you've got characteristics and traits like honesty and, and compassion and, and, and working hard on the right specific things because the direction's there, then I think, you know, you're in a pretty good spot when it comes to developing a, a great team. Does that answer your question? Yes, great. <laughs> Uh, next step. And humor is really important too. There you go. It's vital to have humor. If you don't have humor, <laughs> then, uh, it can get long, draining days, as you guys know. But no, sorry, Karen, keep going. Our next question um, What are the greatest challenges as a coach in creating and maintaining good team dynamics? Um, I think. You know, there's multiple directions you could go with this, but I think, you know, one of the biggest things is, and, and we're really recognizing of late, is uh, how you make everybody feel valued um, and their, how they, the role that they play, that you can, you need to be able to get everybody to a point where they accept their role within the team. Um, and if you, if you can get everybody to that point, uh, and, and, and every role needs to be um, positioned in a, in, a, in a sense of, uh, again, of value and, and, and playing a major role. Uh, and if, 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 if you've been able to paint that picture and make it very, very clear of what each and every individual's role is from the head coach uh, down to the, 
the different interns that you have uh, and right across the playing group, um, then, then you've got a, a starting point to build off. Uh, I, I think that's uh, definitely one of the biggest things is recognising what um, makes people really feel valued and, and empowered or ultimately having ownership uh, or the opportunity to take ownership and lead. I think that's, uh, you know, that, that's a huge thing when it comes to creating team dynamics because um, not every... Not everybody has the same skill sets, nor do you want them to have. We want to be able, we want to be strong as a unit, and uh, and we want to complement each other rather than have fifteen people that are exactly the same or thirty people that are exactly the same. Uh, but trying to, to uh, achieve again that picture that no matter what skill sets or strengths that you have, not one of them is greater than another. It's it's how how you can see uh, or help an individual see the value and the uh, the importance of what they do. Uh, to bring to the party and, and how the, the whole big picture or the big pie put together, et cetera, helps complement what they do and their visions, et cetera, I think is a, a key element. What would, what would you guys say? I mean, you guys have been a part of this group, um, Chris, for six years, seven years, coming up seven years. Yeah? Yeah, you're on mute, Chris, but, uh, and, and Steph, I mean, you've been through multiple Division One basketball teams. Uh, you didn't get traded, but I mean, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> a number of years in Division One basketball, coaching in Division One, and then coming into this. What, what are your guys' thoughts on teams, team dynamics? Um, I think, kind of like what you touched on of, of like figuring out um, and empowering people with their roles, and and um, I think something that stood out to me of when maybe I, I, if a player doesn't know their role or what, um, when that comes up, um, how we create that, create empowerment in your role, even if you don't know what it is. And so I think a, w a way that you've done that um, with us is you, you constantly ask us what, you know, what do you bring to the team? What are your strengths? Um, you know, along when we have our individual, individual development plans and we're talking about what, what we're working on, um, alongside of you, I always say, what's, you know, what's, what do you think your role is? What are your strengths? Um, what do you think you're good at? And I think that really helps with the team dynamics of what, what your role is and how, how important that is. Does that make sense? Chris? Can you guys hear me now? Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, I agree with Steph, just um, knowing like we ideally want everyone to come in and, you know, have value within the team and know what they bring to the table. So I think just maintaining those dynamics by making sure like we create that safe and welcoming environment. And I think that'll go a long way in making sure that everyone can maintain a good dynamic with each other. And then just um, we build off of that, I guess, by having that trust. I, 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 cheers, ladies. And I, I feel like, when I look back at the last two years of my involvement with this group, we spent a lot of time on the team dynamics uh, and how um, how we can build an environment that unifies the group and, and, and we're all going in the same direction and we complement each other. I think one of the places where we really want to expand, um, I know of Emily Bidewell and, and Liz Trohecker and uh, they've really uh, lifted the intensity of uh, the professional development plans over the last 18 months to, to really ensure that we're developing the person, not just the, uh, the rugby player. And, um, but where I feel that we can take that to another level in, in, the, in the near future going into the next season is um, really we spend a lot of time on vision and, and purpose and, uh, and so-called mission statements and how we're going to get there on the rugby side. But really helping an ind the individual understand their um, life purpose, their uh, the 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 legacy ultimately that they want to leave behind, I think is going to be a real key for us kicking on. Um, and if, if we can help unlock that, I think the perseverance and the character is only only going to con sorry the perseverance and the 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 fight to overcome and, and continue to develop more and more character is only going to go through the roof because it's aligned to the team vision and and well, purpose. Um, but if we can get the individuals recognizing how valuable they are because they're like, wow, yeah, actually this is the impact that I can have. This is the, the dream or the aspirations I have to impact um, 
whether it's the next generation or whatever terms you use, I think that'll uh, only enhance how powerful we can potentially come as a unit. Awesome. Um, cool, we'll jump into the next um, question. We'll talk, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the DISC personality profile. And we went, um, our team last year went underwent um, this personality assessment. Brownie, will you just first kind of explain what that was and um, what we kind of learned as a group from that? Yeah, of course. Uh, with regards to the DISC, uh, have, you got a, have you got a slide on it or not? Uh, yes, having some technical difficulties. <laughs> well, anyway, as, as Chris is just sorting that out, I think the, um, I'm sure many people have used it, a number of the US Olympic Committee teams have used this tool. Again, it's a tool, it doesn't define anyone, it's, uh, we ultimately, it, it, it breaks into four quadrants, um, and there's a colour or a letter associated with it, and, and certain characteristics. Uh, and the biggest thing for us was we, we felt that for us to create compassion and connection in the group, um, here we go. For us to better create compa more compassion and connection and for us to get compassion in the first place, you, we've got to create some way of seeing through somebody else's viewpoint. And of course, there's heaps of different ways from qu different just questioning and group discussion scenarios, which we do a lot of, but we wanted to bring in um, tools or a different ways to stimulate these conversations and, and really open up, um, say for example, I'm working with Steph and, and being able to see it through her eyes uh, or how she sees a point of view and uh, how she's been shaped through the experiences that she's gone through her life. And so you've got, you've got the, uh, the four quadrants here and um, I'm not gonna jump so much into the different personality types, but we tend to find we, we, we have all four and but in a relaxed natural state, uh, let's just use the workplace for uh, for example. I'm a, I'm a high C, which means I'm quite consci I'm conscientious, I'm, I'm detail oriented, um, and uh, these other traits that come alongside that uh, associated with the the letter C or the blue. Um, but then you you quite often have another a strong a strong component, which mine was an S, uh, which refers to steady. Um, perseverance, um, really relational orientated. And I think most importantly, if we look at these four quadrants, et cetera, rather than going into the detail of each one, the D and the C or two of them are heavily task orientated and the I and the S are people or relationship orientated. Um, so with that, as you start to understand what people were driven or how they're orientated, uh, how they are, um, some of the traits associated with what's important for them, uh, it just it created a platform to, for us to be able to start talking. Uh, and okay, now I understand why she responds this way quite often. And again, not saying, because if you look at all these personality types, there's great leaders across the world that fall into all four categories in the sense of who will be predominantly a dominant personality like a D or a, a steady personality or an influencing personality. Um, there's, there's great leaders that fall across each category so it was really emphasized at the start that we're not, we're not trying to put you in boxes by any means we're really just we're using this to create more self-awareness and more um peer awareness so that hopefully all going well the compassion enhances which means you know the fight for each other is going to be enhanced and uh so it's something that we're going to use again and uh and, and dive into a little bit more deeper uh from a communication standpoint um I think, you know, for, for you guys, you guys could share where have we really seen this kind of come to life? Uh, give some scenarios where you've, you've seen uh, this tool be referred to and, and, and almost um, help guide certain interactions uh, in our environment. Um, I think what comes to mind first is just uh, on-pitch communication and how, how messages are delivered. I think there's so much communication between people um, while we're playing and the way that those messages are delivered are very, very different. And um, I think being self-aware of how maybe my message is, is being received by each of the different you know, types of people um, and then how each type of people, what, what their intent is and how they deliver a message to me. So um, I think constantly, I think every, every day when we train, we um, having those conversations and understanding where the person's coming from and how, what, you know, if someone's a, maybe a D more direct person um, and their message may come off more 
blunt and um, harsh. Um, that's just their maybe style. So medium half way of um, understanding that they're not trying to be harsh. They're just trying to deliver a message. And um, so things like that, I think I've I've come across. I think that, you know, what Steph's highlighted there, and the, the, as she's explaining it, what I'm hearing, um, I think the biggest thing is, uh, as we go through the slides here, lovely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but as we uh, is sometimes, especially in performance communication, like on pitch in the moment, <laughs> you, you're going to respond your natural way. So having the awareness of your teammate in that situation of what their, you know, what's their dominant per, uh, dominant communication style or trait, or you know, what are they likely to come across, so that when when they do, it's you, you're not getting you're less likely to get a negative response. You, you're going to be like, okay, cool. I'm, I'm aware their intentions are, are fine. Uh, what was the information more so than what was the tone or the delivery is key. I mean, I think off pitch, you start to give a bit more back uh, give and take. But when we're on pitch in the heat of the moment, when the pressure is on, generally recognising these traits is key for receiving a message uh, to get a positive outcome more so than necessarily delivering one compared to off pitch, maybe more around, actually I can deliver more effectively to, uh, towards specific individuals. Yeah, I think that was a big discussion that we've had of, um, well, you should, I think the other person be, should be, should be just be able to receive my message however I give it. And then the person's, the other person saying, well, I think that you should come to my level and be, yeah, be conscious of my profile and how I receive it. And so it was kind of back and forth of where is the balance of, receiving it right or you know t you know expressing it correctly and i think that's what we kind of came up when you're on the pitch it's all about performance communication of how you know it's it's in the moment you're just going to express how you you know talk how you naturally naturally talk and so and it was off pitch that it, it's a little bit more give and take on on both sides so cool uh next question um how do you facilitate trust between the players and staff Chris, you've kind of touched on this a little bit. There you go. <laughs> oh my God. Um, so you <laughs> touched... experience. What have you what have you experienced? What's led to like the, the trust and buy in? You know, what are some of the examples? And you can be transparent of where you've um, you know, where we've experienced uh, potential doubt that's that's uh, fragmented our, our potential trust at times. Uh, yeah, so in my experience, um, huge things for building trust would be like transparency and honesty, creating like a safe environment for everyone to be transparent and be honest. So I think we um, did a lot this season on going back to just study how we communicate with each other and also not sugarcoating things, like being able to have authentic conversations, even if it seems uncomfortable in the moment, even if it seems like unproductive in the moment but um having those authentic conversations will really lead to the trust because otherwise you just you don't say anything nothing gets accomplished you don't build that trust between teammates whereas if you have those honest conversations and we actually have um things to say that aren't always going to get us away from conflict because all conflict isn't negative you know we can have that conflict that leads to a productive thing and when constructive criticism um that'll keep us going so in the staff player relationship in particular, like just having that transparency and that honesty goes um, a long way. So, I mean, Steph, Chris has been around for a, a number of, um, uh, through a number of different coaches and, and programming. Uh, Steph literally came into our environment uh, middle of 2018. Um, so, I mean, Steph, for you, in the sense of what, what have been some of the, like we talk about the disc test uh, from a, uh, or the disc profile from a communication tool. What have been some of the, putting in the spot here, what's some of the uh, tools or, or things that we've got, we've actually implemented uh, or completed to try and enhance uh, the, the trust in the group or the, the transparency uh, or to remove ultimately, because one of the biggest uh, things that breaks down trust is, is gossip um, and side conversations. So what's some of the stuff that, that we have implemented over the last two years that's, that's been successful in helping uh, develop this? Um, well, I think first off, it's 
coming into this environment, um, it's a lot, it was much more welcoming of conflict. And so conflict was, you know, positive conflict was really like welcomed and almost, you know, promoted of, um, you know, you don't, we want to, you know, not push anything to the side, like be upfront about everything kind of as Chris, Chris touched on. Um, and, you know, if you, if you have an issue, be, be self-aware of how, you know, how you deal with the conflict, but um, deal with conflict, so, so to say. And I think um, our week, we have weekly culture meetings and um, those are the times where we like to discuss kind of the things that maybe we have conflict on or bring up things that um, need to be talked about. Does that answer your question? It does. It does. I mean, it, it's cool. I put you on the spot, and it's cool just to hear what kind of comes to mind straight away. And uh, because I mean, these, these are the things. And like you've heard us talk about the different. We use the disc tool for uh, uh, to enhance how we communicate and how we build uh, compassion and trust with each other, and how we see it through each other's eyes. And ultimately, communication uh, and effective communication flood through everything that we do and 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 I, I brought up the point around gossip or side conversation and, and ultimately that just creates division and, and creates doubt and, and issues um, so having uh, it all intertwined having uh, the opportunity to understand each other's uh, communication styles and, and, and giving and taking and then uh, having the constant platform where we the checkpoints or the um, kind of like mock scenarios that we run through or we practice to build to build comfort and having those those tough conversations or uh, or or dealing with issues and, and keeping people uh, accountable um, but we've also done we did something in the sense of uh, and I, I see this as, as a big part of trust uh, yes transparency is a good old buzzword but uh, in the sense of as, as, a, as a leader or as a coach it's critical and, and, and all management um, and, and leadership within the team, it's critical that um, you recognize what's vital information and what's, uh, you know, just nice to know. Um, and then, but also recognize how much of that nice to know stuff is actually going to create a little bit more comfort or a little bit more awareness and understanding to scenarios and decisions that will help to maintain uh, that full belief uh, in the direction that we're, we're going. Um, but also, in the sense of you're talking about that, in the sense of the transparency side of things, we've also installed a, a no complaining rule, uh, which means, doesn't mean that you can't complain, but it was built off the back of a book that we, we read in the very first season and we've redistributed to the, the ones that uh, joined us um, at the start of season two. Uh, and, and a lot of that was reckon. And, and yeah, it was about recognizing the thoughts, recognizing the challenge or the frustration or what you were, you know, the complaint you potentially had. Uh, and then, all right, cool. What's the solution or what's, what would be a solution that I'd have for that? And then who's the appropriate person to speak to? Who's the person who can influence and change that? Uh, and depending on what that is, whether it's player to player, um, player to staff or player to head coach, et cetera, or staff to staff, um, it, really it, it, it's trying to okay cool so the solution is going to be best achieved or going to be achieved most likely if we go to the source and we go to the individuals that can actually influence it and i think that leads you've got to build the the, the you've got to build the compassion and the, the safety in the environment to uh, allow people uh, to, to make people feel comfortable to come and have those conversations especially you know we've experienced with me i'd, I'd have half a squad that would were willing to and half the squad probably wasn't willing to and so there's, there was different avenues for them to, to get a message to me etc uh, but we really want to get to a point where each and everyone in the squad is willing to come to the to the source and I, I think we're at that point now even though there's still a little bit of uncomfort um, but then of course if we're going to be brave and we're going to live by our values then sometimes we're going to be willing to be uncomfortable and have those conversations if we know it's best for the teams and have it with the right people uh, rather than, you know, causing division uh, to make sure that the boat's going as fast as possible in the right direction. So, sorry, Chris. That was good. What you want to say, Tommy? Oh, no, that's good. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Um, 
All right. Um, next question. Uh, we're going to, we, we touched on it a little bit um, about communication and the disc profiles and how we kind of um, use that. And um, so how do you implement, like when you're talking to different players and communicating on the pitch, do you, how do you, or when you're talking, I guess, to the group and you have all these different communication styles and types, um, how do you balance um, using all those with your players versus a team and, and whatnot? Yeah, um, <laughs> good question. Um, you could have sent me these before we started, you know? Sorry about you guys. Oh. <laughs> um, if we just, if we go on pitch to start off with uh, in a group setting, Understanding the majority of our squad, uh, oh, sorry, we have quite a predominant kind of, uh, we have quite a dominant um, group that was uh, in the sense of, let's say 70% of our playing group is a, is a similar uh, personality type um, in the sense of regarding their communication, how they want to receive a message or how they learn or how they uh, in, how they engage and, and they take information. So recognizing what the core of the group is, uh, I think it's a great starting point um, to ensure that that's really where you, you need to start uh, to make sure that the majority are getting the message across and then identifying the other uh, potentially other individuals that need to be addressed in a different manner, whether it's in a team setting or not. I, I think uh, I, I look back to Baritz in France and uh, it's quite funny because I took uh, Chris's uh, traits um, or um, some of the information that we gathered off the the, the disc profile tool, and um, now under pressure, Chris will become one uh, will uh, become more into one zone or communication side of things, and under uh, under her general normal relaxed self, she'll be another way, uh, and. The funny thing was, under pressure, I, I, I smacked her in the face with the one that the opposite one, uh, and and so that was kind of like the way she responded was brilliant. So fortunately, the natural tendency comes through hard, uh, and comes through well and successful. But in that scenario, and, and I think I use that scenario because it was a positive performance outcome on pitch, but it wasn't necessarily the most effective um, coach to, <laughs> coach to player or coach to leader um, interaction. Uh, was I've got to know each and every individual I, I work with and I've got to know what their natural traits and tendencies are but more importantly in competition I've got to know what their tendencies are under pressure uh, and in a stressed environment and if I understand those then I'm more likely to be able to first just very quickly recognize who I'm addressing and respond to them effectively uh, or to communicate with them most effectively for them to receive a message I want to give. Um, but I also think the team needs to recognise what my natural tendencies are because in a group setting, it's impossible to get it right with every individual uh, on every occasion. Uh, and it's more likely going to be, okay, can, do the girls know my heart? Do they know my intentions? Uh, so when I do get it wrong uh, or I do come across in a way that's not, a, not ideal, uh, they're still able to receive the message, which hopefully I would take as that's what Chris was able to do in that moment in Brits. So that was, hopefully that, and then always in a one-on-one -on -one setting, it's um, it's it's give and take and recognizing what that individual needs and uh, you know how it's going to be best received. And and for me, sometimes it's uncomfortable because I may not want to be as direct and in somebody's face. Uh, although I'm getting more comfortable with Nia Tapper and, uh, and, and, and those <laughs> on that. I just throw, I thought I'd throw you in there, Nia, since you, you know, no doubt that you're listening to this one. Um, but, uh, but also, once you start to see how people respond, when you do put yourself out of your comfort zone to more uh, deliver messages, especially the ones who are a little bit more passive and, and um, passive in the sense of giving a message, uh, to somebody who wants a direct, straight to the point message. When you see the outcome, you see the response, then suddenly you feel a lot more comfortable, you feel safer in delivering that message the next time, uh, which is probably more so from a team standpoint rather than myself towards a player. Um, but we're definitely seeing that come through quite nicely. 
and going off of that like you touched on that and then also Steph touched on it earlier like it, it doesn't have to be like a one and done type of conversation like we it's a learning curve you know we all we can go right. back we can have an additional conversation with these folks maybe we got it wrong the first time but we can always follow up and have another conversation conversation with them and hopefully you guys kind of um, build that bond between the two of you so that the next time you know like okay I'll you know maybe approach it this way or that or another way I, I mean I, it, it's brilliant Chris um, I'm so heavenly I'm so heavenly brilliant I'm, I'm so <laughs> heavily, heavily focused uh, on focused or have such a strong belief uh, that your environment shapes you um, and that's why we spend so much time on our environment, more so like in the sense of it's, it's more critical than the rugby. I mean, we're getting to a point now where give or take the way implementing our style of play with our attributes, go against the Kiwis, the Aussies, the throw the Fijians, them in the French in there. You know, the, these teams are starting to, they don't play a similar style, but in the sense of any given day, the attributes are there to, to win or to get a result. Um, and for me, where I feel like the point of difference is it's how healthy, how strong your, uh, or how safe your environment is and then how effective your environment is at stimulating growth and empowering people and, uh, and ultimately being willing to be vulnerable uh, and go back and have those conversations that Chris and Steph have referred to because ultimately um, that's what's going to lead to, um, and I think we've done a pretty good job on, on and, and I'm not talking about us as management, us as a group, because uh, where we've wanted our culture, our environment to go to has been, well, heavily, um, I won't say player-led, because I think as 24 players at the time and, and eight staff, we were all involved. Um, and it really allowed us to put some lines in the stand and, and take ownership as a, as a collective uh, and, and, and lead to those that conflict resolution or, or dealing with issues along the way more effectively so that we can fight we, we, we continue to fight and we, we want to fight for each other when we come into competition and we want to support each other uh, no matter what's going on in life uh, because we want to see the best and, and uh, best happen for that person and, and because we've become a family uh, become more of a family um, a tight-knit knit group then um, you know we're, we're willing to do what's right not necessarily what we're comfortable with well put. Uh, next on to competitiveness because we're a competitive bunch. Um, at what point is competitiveness unhealthy and how have we trained putting the team first? <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you my viewpoint. It might be different to what the girls see. Um, we do have a very competitive group of individuals people that have overcome a lot of different challenges uh, in their journeys, individual journeys. And, and if they didn't have that perseverance, they wouldn't develop the character for them to last and then handle the environment or the high performance environment they're in um, day in, day out. I think the challenge for me is we spend so much time in our environment and our, uh, I suppose, how unified we are uh, that at times that can, the relational aspect can get in the way of maximizing the level of competition on the training pitch that would replicate what we're doing on the World Series. Are we ultimately willing to beat each other up at, at the intensity and the speed and the physicality that's needed to uh, take us to a new level and, and the, well, first and foremost, the, the required level of the World Series? And, and that's been challenging for me. Um, uh, and, I, and I will create a, a, a bit of a, a, a difference here. Is coming over from, I, I'd worked with uh, female athletes bef before, uh, more on a small group setting in a rugby setting, um, or but I've worked with uh, a netball team in South Africa uh, back early on when I was coaching. And um, one of the things I've really, really noticed when working with a, a group of female athletes is the, the, the relational aspect is so, so high. Uh, and, and when that is healthy, then the, the strength is huge. It's flipping the way they fight for each other, the way they get a battle is outstanding. Um, when that's not, 
the and, and focus on competitiveness side of things. Uh, sorry, sorry. When that is, when you go over to the really trying to um, lift the intensity in training, especially when we go full, into full combat, it's it can be tough because what I've noticed at times, if we're not aware and we don't set our attentions effectively, it can turn into a little bit more of a let's get through this because I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings or I don't want to offend or, or push anybody, or rub anybody up the wrong way. Um, and I think we've had some really good success at times and in short periods, but we've also had a lot of uh, times where it's had to be addressed or it's kind of just not been at the standard of execution that's needed to, to really uh, classify this aspect of our how we do things at the level that we want it to be or the standard that we want it to be. And, um, but as I've said, I've seen some really good examples uh, where that competitiveness does come out and we don't hold back. Um, we've just got to try and get that to be a bit more consistent so that we can go to the next level um, when it comes to not beating up ourselves but playing against the opposition because ultimately how you train is how you play. That's how I would see it. That's a little bit of an overview. It's maybe not necessarily in the narrative that they were thinking that was we were going to go with this particular question, but um, hopefully it gives some insight. I mean, ladies, you got anything else to share on that? Um, because I think there, there's definitely, they wouldn't be where they are without that kind of fight and that competitiveness of wanting to win. And we see it in different ways, but when we go live and we go into combat and we go into ultimately trying to make our, we're playing seven on seven or five on five, but not in your team for that 10 minutes. They're your opposition, they're your enemy. Switching from the, the, the uh, what's it called, the flexibility to switch between the unified team and now suddenly they're your enemy. If we can unlock that, then I think that's going to be, um, to, to be more consistent, I think that's going to be pretty special and how it drives us forward. Yeah, I think a common thing that I think we hear is, um, you know, you brought to light what the compet competitiveness um, does and how it can be positive. And I think like naturally we don't, I don't want to go out and hurt Chris. I don't, it's a core play contact sport. I don't want to go full out on Chris, but you know, if Chris is going hundred percent and I'm going 40%, you know, Chris isn't getting anything out of it um, as well as myself. So I'm um, kind of putting the full of like, if you're not going to be your 100% and go full out, then it's not, you know, I'm, I'm essentially hurting my teammate as well. So I think putting that bit overarching big picture um, helps us, I think, to do that. Group sync, what's group sync? Steph, you're on mute, bud. Yeah. Um, so I guess having a big group of people and like we talked about with different personalities, more, more passive people and more dominant people, how do you, how do you make sure that not only the big voices are the ones being heard or how do you make sure that yeah. it's not just everyone's agreeing because the group is, that's what the group, the group thinks and different opinions. Um, maybe those that can are very valuable, but aren't going to speak up. How do you make sure everybody, I guess, um, is heard? Yeah. Oh yeah. Great question. Um, and I, I love the, the color and the, uh, the, what's it called? The image that you put up there. Um, English isn't my first language, so you know that's why I'm struggling with my vocab. I'm sure there's a better word to refer to. And, uh, no. <laughs> anyway, um, sorry. Um, on that particular topic, I think where we've had success, we've created opportunities for we've, we've silenced big voices, and big voices don't mean loud voices, but in the sense of the ones that are more uh, confident or, or generally like uh, had a little bit more experience, a little bit more comfortable, and 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 delivering a message in the moment. Uh, so they'll, they'll tend to dominate the, the huddle conversations, um, especially when uh, we've only got short periods of time. Now, putting uh, limitations, like uh, there's been times where, say, Chris, um, uh, Abby, one of our captains, Lauren Doyle, uh, Alif Kauta, they haven't been allowed to speak in those huddles uh, for a whole session. Uh, and, and potentially at time, not all the time, but sometimes you'll also nominate somebody that's quieter uh, to be one of the group leaders in many ways. If you've got four groups, uh, four teams of five, you'll be a, a different leader and, and they need to facilitate those conversations. 
Uh, and then you just, and, and we were, again, if we would have had success is we, we just silenced the other voice. Uh, and uh, I think it's been quite valuable for the ones that have been silenced as well, in the sense of just being able to understand, because I know for myself when I'm silenced and I, and, it's, and it occurs where the athletes are able to, to share their voice or their opinion or how they see something, it's, it gives me a better picture of actually what they're taking in. I think I recognised after group uh, year one, sorry, um, I had a number of players who could repeatedly uh, repeat ultimately the direction on the rugby pitch, which I was trying to instill and get us going and, and you know, uh, what we're brought into. Um, but I had some that, that still couldn't. And what I mean in the sense of I wasn't necessarily recognising, uh, I knew what they were trying to say uh, at times, but then at other times I'm like, wow, this is interesting. This is what they've taken in. This is, uh, and, and if you don't allow them to, if you don't allow that each, every, uh, each, each individual to, to be able to share their thoughts and to share how they see something, then you won't really pick up what they've actually taken in and, and are we actually all aligned? And I think that was um, one of the biggest learnings for me from, from year one was even some of our more experienced players, some of the players that were heavily involved on the World Series in year one, they weren't saying the right things. Um, and it's not about saying the right things, it's about doing the right things. Uh, but if they're not saying the right things, then they're doing things unconsciously uh, and trying to get it where they're conscious of what they're doing, aligned with actually doing it, uh, it is critical. And I think it's a great thing for older players to understand what their teammates are doing or, or you know, the so-called uh, players that tend to lead with their voice. Uh, and and also for management uh, as, as a way of okay yeah what's really going in here what are they taking in uh, are we all on the same page uh, oh gee that's a great idea hadn't seen it that way because quite often the quieter voices are the ones that are actually a little bit more reflective too so that that's one way um, sorry uh, what else I did want to say is if we've started to get uh, different small groups to start looking at components of play and, and what they see and what they notice. And it, it all falls into our playing frameworks or system or shape, if you want to call it, uh, and, and within our principles. But so we will align to our principles and our playing uh, philosophy or, or um, and, 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 and play um, review film, uh, have a discussion through, through those lenses. Um, but not giving them the not giving the athletes the the out of okay cool here's all the information here's what i'm seeing what are you guys you know are you agreeing blah 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 making them go and find those uh the solutions or, or find the critical information uh has some has been something too that we've um really started to drive home to try and make sure that we're getting a, a better big picture rather than just it's one person's or two or three people's uh viewpoint of where we're going All right, and now we are moving on to working as a unit. Um, have there been times when the team had challenges working together and how did we overcome them? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and this comes down from the top up. You know, I, I wasn't, if I look at Sydney and the season, um, there's examples through training, but let's just, let's just use one that's visible. Uh, we went into a tournament um, where doubt had started to creep in for multiple reasons, uh, and whether that was, and, and a lot of that came from the transparency um, from myself, uh, and and not intentional. It wasn't like I felt like I was holding things back. I just felt like I was providing the need to know, uh, the critical information rather than the nice to know. So I didn't want them to be distracted, uh, but, but also in in the happening, then we started to see some. Uh, things that just just challenged our our values in many ways um and 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 it was a nice little checkpoint for us to recognize what we kind of fell out found ourselves falling into uh and and when we're not in a mindset of you know if you look at that little diagram which, which is brilliant again where'd you find these google <laughs> i'm gonna steal that one um but let's say the guy holding up or the lady or the guy holding up the tea um you know if 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 W is not doing what he wants, 
um, then, uh, or, or he's not doing what he wants, then depending on what his viewpoint is and, and, uh, and what mindset he's in will depend on how he responds and, and how tight we stay as a unit. And I think what we found was a lot of frustration and, and a lot of different things affecting our, our belief in the direction that we were going. And that ultimately came down to the, the boundaries or the, the direction and also the boundaries that I allowed to uh, get a little bit grey um, and, and cloudy. And uh, so I think, you know, the biggest thing is if, if you've got, if you've got clear, clear direction that everybody buys into and it's a lot easier to get by and if they've been part of building and, and de defining what that direction is, uh, with the environment, which cultivates uh, that safety through effective communication and and uh, and, and serving each other, uh, I think you 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 start to see this stuff flourish. Um, but it's when uh, it's when ultimately our challenges or uh, uh, adversity comes along, uh, and we're, we're our, our personal values and our team values are challenged. Uh, and our, our natural habits start to creep through. Have we created the habits that we want to make us as strong and tight and team first as possible? Um, and I think what we found in Sydney was we, we created a lot of really good habits. Uh, and, and there's just two or three elements where we just had to um, just ultimately, you know, recognize it, acknowledge, take responsibility uh, and, and, and choose to go, we recognize what creates this. We don't want to go here again. Lovely. We're bought in, we're going this direction, but now from this experience, uh, we've, we've got additional awareness to ensure that we don't allow those things to creep in in the future because it's important. It means that much to us that we don't want to, and we want to recognize those things earlier. So hopefully that answers the question. And I think going off of that, um, some of the challenges that we face as players, like working within the unit, um, is working within our roles and then also putting what's best for the team first. Like we'll have, you can't control your thoughts, right? So if you come in at a big game, your team's down, you may think, oh, I have to be the one to score. I have to be the one to do this, but maybe necessarily that's not what the team needs. The team needs for you to just come in and do your job and that'll help us work as a unit. So we do battle things like that on the national team, like feeling like we have to make something happen or we need to do this right now, where it's really like, if we wanna work, if we wanna get that try, it's really like how well we can work together instead of the individual. Like there will be moments when we need to do our job and that we'll be shining as an individual, but there are also times when our job right now is to pass it to that person and let them shine and let them score the try. So we just, um, we work a lot with that. Yeah, brilliant, Chris. I think that comes back to some of the stuff at the start of this presentation and uh, all this webinar um, around recognizing your strengths and, and accepting your role and, and responsibilities. And uh, I think if you if you go back to the Dubai tournament thing, when it watched that, um, when things are going easy, like when we had Canada in the last pool game and put 38 points on them, which was the first time I'd ever done something like that. And it was just flowing because the individuals within our team and within the collective uh, were able to express themselves beautifully and people coming on and playing their role in the system uh, was complementing the, the individuals were complementing the system and vice versa uh, and then in the same tournament when we go to the last game which we'd just come off the back of a, a bit of a, a, a little bit of a wake-up call against the Kiwis we had the Aussies in the third fourth playoff and and that wasn't easy that wasn't an easy game in the sense of it wasn't clean and precise but we fought and we fought as a unit, the same as we did as a unit in the Glendale final. It wasn't a pretty game. It wasn't clinical rugby quite often, but the individuals, when they stepped out there, they stuck to their role and they tried to do their role most effectively. And, and it ultimately led to the team getting the result done uh, and, and us being a lot closer to our ideal, well, sticking to the process and, our, and being a lot closer and uh, getting towards that ultimate picture that we were trying to achieve. So. I think that kind of goes right into the next question and um, just touching on player roles and um, you, I think you want your a player to stick to their role, but how do you show the importance of sticking to the role, but then fostering growth outside of that role? 
Yeah. Um, it's it's interesting because the the role that each and every, each, every player plays has got. I mean, really, first and foremost, what's the attributes that players got? What's their super strengths? Why are they in the team? Because it's not about their vulnerabilities or their their areas or where, where they're you know, ultimately weaknesses per se. That's not what got them the team. It was, it was the super strengths and the things that make them special. And um, so that's first and foremost, that, that's always part of the player's role. Um, and just recognizing what Chris said in the sense of where you are on the pitch and what's best for the team in that moment, um, you know, that, that that's obviously going to, to be key for you deciding, do I use, do I need to use my, my super strengths right now? Um, or do I need to just play my role? Just, just, just do what's right for the team. Uh, it comes back to that in the last three questions, really. And uh, I think um, if every individual knows what their super strengths are and they can look through that lens uh, and, they, and they believe in the frameworks that we play or the systems or the strategies that we play, uh, then they know they'll get their opportunities. And again, if we've cultivated an environment that uh, has for the individual shown how the team complements them, but also built the characteristics of this bigger meaning and there's, there's, a, there's a greater purpose here but other than self, uh, then the buy-in to sticking to, to doing what you need to do in those moments, but also being confident and excited to, to express yourself um, 50 seconds later uh, is critical. It almost comes down to the the awareness and the discipline to do what you need to do. Uh, and sometimes that involves you, um, you know, that involves Chris running, stepping and fending somebody off and running 80 metres to score. Uh, and sometimes that involves her chasing someone down uh, 80 metres the other way because somebody else has not done their role or missed their tackle and, and covering them up. And, uh, um, or Steph creating a gap for her and the gap looks great but suddenly recognizing, yeah, I could score here, but actually we're with fit that's it's sixty percent chance compared to ninety percent chance. I'll just I'll just shift the ball to the outside channel and, and, and really recognizing what the actual team goal is or the, the bigger purpose is, um, I think helps everybody stick to the process a lot more effectively. And um, the only, the biggest thing that's gonna challenge that is when you've got that lack of trust or buy in or or, or doubt for different reasons that have come up as we've spoken of it through this, uh, through this webinar, so. Awesome. Speaking of roles, we are gonna go into the um, coach-captain relationship. And also this is the last question that we have um, for Brownie and then we will open up the floor for more questions. So what role do you think the coach-captain relationship plays in having a successful team? And also, what does that relationship look like? And is it different for different captains? Yeah, personally, uh, I see it's 100% um, uh, dependent on the characteristics and the strengths of the, the people involved. Um, so, for example, my dynamic with uh, um, last season with Lauren and Nicole was different to the dynamic or the uh, uh, with Abby and Chris this season. And it doesn't make one better than the other. It's just, it's what what's in the cocktail um, and what are the strengths and, and what do people bring to the party? And uh, ultimately what I see first and foremost is I see every individual in our team as a leader. Uh, they're an influencer, they've, they've got a platform and, and they've got strengths that we want to cultivate and, and bring out of them and, uh, and that complement the group as a whole. Um, and if you look at, we use Chris and Abby, they've, they've both got uh, a lot of where they are in the process and, and, and how they are and, and growing and, uh, and where they are already with certain traits that that, that people want to follow, that it's already a much higher. Um, and so just recognizing what those traits are and how we can complement each other is key. I, one of the big things though, which is different, I see between um, say coach and the whole squad versus coach and the two or three captains or leadership group that you might have is that players want to be relational with each other and they want to have each other's back per se. Hopefully the environment that we've cultivated has created that family picture where the, the parents or the older siblings, the older brother is, uh, is, is we, we all have the right, we all are on the same, have the same vision, the same 
desires the same. Um, we're not fighting against each other. Uh, but I know that uh, it, it's vital that the, the, the players feel that they have the captain's ear um, as much as the, the coach uh, can trust that the captain's uh, 100% behind the vision and 100% aligned with him. Uh, and I think one of the big challenges for those, uh, not those captains, but any captains, is recognising when to, to share what and when not to share because they get insight to a lot more information than the general group because quite often they're brought into discussions to work out how we can make it most successful and most effective for the group. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, I will share a little bit more uh, around other players um, to try and get a better understanding so I can make a better decision. Now, if that information goes to one of the players that's been spoken about, then that's gonna potentially hurt the transparency. Uh, especially if it goes to that player before I'm able to speak to that player. Now, it's, it's not about anything, generally it's not about anything uh, to do, uh, it's all about how we can enhance and help or deal with a situation that needs to be dealt with. Uh, and that's where I think uh, the coach-captain relationship uh, or the, the captains um, become a little bit more, uh, you know, that, that they're in that position because they've earned earned that, they've earned that trust from the coach and uh, and from management. Um, and I think that's where it's a little bit different from my relationship with the other leaders that I have in the team, uh, which I'm referring to as every player. Um, there's a little bit more information, a little bit more um, full picture given to, to those people so that they can help, first and foremost, buy in and make sure that they're bought in or they can challenge and question and, uh, and we get the best uh, outcome for uniting the group following uh, that occurrence. Um, Chris, do you want to share anything else from your side on that? Uh, you pretty much nailed it. Um, we just basically, you know, just in my experience as being one of the co-captains and working with you, um, we just really want to make sure that we uh, make our teammates proud to have us represent them pretty much like we want to make sure that in all aspects we are being good representatives of the team because the team is trusting the team's trusting us to basically in some instances speak on their behalf and have their best interests at heart at all times and also be a good example of someone that they're proud to say this person is representing us for the team and representing um, a good example I guess for you know rugby players all over so we always want to you know, set a good example. And then we also have that relationship with the coach. And in that setting, they've got to be willing to challenge and question for the betterment of the group. Um, and they've got to be willing to say, no, I disagree. I, I don't agree with this. Da, 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 da. And if it's a healthy working relationship, then when we walk out of that room, uh, meaning, you know, in your environment, depending on, we, you know, I can't I can only speak about our environment. I'd like to think it's a healthy relationship. Uh, when you walk out of that room, whether you've, just like with, with, with management, just like with the group of players on the, on the team, you don't always agree 100%. Hopefully, that, that, that the, plan, that the hope is that you'll get there 99% of the time, um, but you've got to be willing to, to question and challenge, um, but then also unite when you walk out of that door and, uh, and, and hopefully, again, if the coach or the, the, you know, the coach has done the, provided the right insight, or the, the right um, quality of insight, it'll be a lot easier to uh, to make sure that the, the right outcome occurs or the outcome that you want occurs. Awesome. All right, that's all the questions that we had, but we have a couple questions um, we'll quickly get to. Um, we'll, we'll put these two together. They're kind of the, one and the same, but how do you good and bad conflict from each other and how do you address bad conflict conflict and turn it um i, I, I don't think it's I, I don't think it's any good or bad just ultimately it's conflict it's uh how it's dealt with uh is probably effective or it's not effective <laughs> ineffective or effective, you know there's a scale and, and you can decide on how effective that really was uh and as chris and steph had shared earlier on it's um have you cultivated an environment and an expectation that if it's not dealt with well, that it will be dealt with 
uh, again, by people addressing, going, having the conversation that's needed, the, the individuals that are involved going and doing what's needed to find a solution and that may take three or four conversations. Um, so, you know, yes, I think there's a, there's a code of conduct or a, um, we, don't we don't have a code of conduct. We've got a, a value system and there's behaviors associated with that. Of course, when it comes down to law, and if anything, uh, in the sense of, but in the sense of, in, without going to physical abuse or uh, etc., um, we're, we're 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 cultivating an environment that encourages that to be dealt with, and 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 hopefully creating the self awareness and the peer awareness and the compassion for each other. That means that you can go back and forward if, it, if it's once uh, with, with the initial conversation, or it's ten times to ultimately get to the, the best outcome or the, the solution that's required, which is best for the team. Awesome. Um, Chris, this weekend can be for you. How do you mentally come together in the last minutes before kickoff? Mentally come together. So in the, so we do go to warm up and then after that we go into like a holding area. It can be a locker room and maybe a hallway, but it's pretty much before we enter the tunnel. Um, it honestly depends on the player and we're all individuals as, that come together to form a team. So um, some people like to joke around and play with their teammates while we're putting on our jersey. Some people like to really go within and like reflect and try to calm their mind before the game. So we kind of allow everyone the space to basically mentally prepare how they want. And then we go into the tunnel, we run onto the field, and then um, either we actually have a few people that do our pregame speeches. So someone will do a pregame speech for us and kind of get us riled up. And then we come together. Um, we say USA on three, and then, you know, we, um, yeah, we just do the chant and then we get ready for kickoff. So that's us. I think something that's really important is we all, like, people have different ways of connecting, but we'll all touch each other. Um, I think both in the mm -hmm. tunnel, who you're in front of or behind, there's always some type of connection. So you just are either looking your teammates in the eyes or you're, you have, you know, physical contact with them, but just some connection to kind of put yourself and then the speech, obviously, to get yourself, your team just unified. We talk about uh, task at hand a lot and, and what I've just referred to is ultimately trying to bring them back into the present moment um, uh, to recognise what they're going to do right now. Um, so uh, there's different things that they do as well with the breasts and the, um, and the so-called touching or the, um, the, you know, the, the prompting conversations. So. Awesome. I think that's all the time we have. Brownie, you got anything else for us? Uh, no, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I do. Uh, I suppose just to sum it up, I think one of the, the special things about being in a team environment is you can achieve so much more. It's, it's cliche, um, but if you can cultivate that environment uh, with the with the people that have the, the mindset to, to to aspire to go to achieve and and, and to grow and uh, and have the skill sets to do what's required, uh, and and then then you're halfway there, um, and because if you don't have that, obviously, you, you, you might as well be individual because you're going to be fragmented, so there's not going to be any power or strength in the group. Uh, but that, I mean, that's one of the things why, I mean, I had a tennis background and a rugby background, and what I loved about the rugby most was, as we unify, what we could achieve and what we did experience was, was massive. But there's a, like in any kind of uh, relationship setting, um, some of the key components are how effective can your communication be, and that's... Uh, and that also comes down to how well you know each other and each other's intentions and how we, how they, each individual sees life and, and, and see certain, you know, why are they arguing or debating it this way, et cetera, or seeing something from this angle. Um, but it's our job as coaches to, to create an environment that enhances uh, that self and peer awareness that leads to that compassion and the direction to achieve the goal. So I, um, I hope there's been some valuable insight in this uh, this webinar. Awesome. All right. Cheers. Bye.